Nantucket is an island 30 miles out to sea, off the coast of Massachusetts. It's a small island, 5 miles wide and 14 miles long. It's the sixth most expensive vacation town in the U.S. according to the rating agencybundle.com and it's known as one of the travel destinations for the wealthy. People come for the luxury accommodations, boutique shopping, and some of the most beautiful, sparsely crowded beaches in the Northeast. In this episode of The Deshay Show, we'll be seeing a little bit different side of Nantucket through the eyes of our local guides. We'll explore some of these beautiful beaches, learn about the history and ecology of the island by visiting the Whaling Museum and the Cascada Wildlife Refuge. We'll also meet Chef Seth Rayner, owner of the renowned Latin-influenced seafood restaurant Corazon del Mar, who made a special menu just for us. We'll also go shopping Deshay style and we'll get some insider tips on how to see the island if you're not a millionaire. Welcome to Code Hall. This is where we're staying our first few days in Nantucket with Julia, Mark, and Dominique, our guides. Welcome to Toad Hall. I'm sure my hair looks fantastic right now. <laughs> Chocolate stains. Slept in this last night. So we've just arrived to Pulpis in Toad Hall. And we're staying with Julia, Dominique, and Mark, who've been here for generations and reside here in the summer. This is Toad Hall's kitchen. It comes from the novel, The Wind in the Willows, that's right? <laughs> you have to read The Wind in the Willows and you will understand the name of the play. Toad Hall is a really special place with a charming rustic feel. Nothing in the house has changed since the 50s, offering us a reminder of what life was like in Nantucket 60 years ago. To get started with our exploration of Nantucket, we signed up for a guided tour of the Cascada Wildlife Refuge, a unique and beautiful area of Nantucket. These tours are run by the Trustees of Reservation, one of the first private conservation organizations started in the country, who now give tours about the history and ecology of this area. And if you can imagine coming here in the, around 1880 with that big steamer trunk full of clothing, because if you've ever seen movies, they wore a lot of clothing. Yeah. They didn't go swimming, they went bathing. And they had bathing suits that looked like long underwear. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You come to a little cottage like this, it has no running water, Okay. had no electricity, right. had no bathroom, and it had no kitchen. Everybody <laughs> ate at the wall in it. If you look all around the island, you can see all the shoals. And if, if you, in the history of the island, over 700 wrecks that they know of. Okay. So, many of those ships carry barrels of rose hips. Because the scurvy, and I've got one here, I cut it open this morning for the tour. They, they say that the rose hip, the vitamin C content is like, uh, 60 times more powerful than an orange yes. and they used to carry barrels of these on the tours you know, I mean on the you know on the ships for the sailors because of scurvy and when the ships broke up the barrels broke up they went all over the island and it would dry up and the seeds would go everywhere you'll see loads and loads of rugosa rose everywhere uh, oh, you see over there there's a float and then if you look to your binocular you're gonna see those birds the black birds they're drying their wings and as I tell you, these are birds that swim.
tour took us six miles through beautiful, unspoiled coastal wildlife, and we made it to the Great Point Lighthouse. Now we just have to climb to the top. Wow. This is really cool. Take your finger and cover that hole. Okay, and watch the light. Watch the light. Come on. See it? It's on. You see the light? Yeah. This is the light pole. It's so small. <laughs> this area right here is Great Point, and it's part of the Cascada Kotu Wildlife Refuge and the Nantucket National Wildlife Refuge. And we're really lucky to be able to come up to the lighthouse because it's actually blocked off. It was restricted because of some endangered species. Can you tell us about those birds? Yep, um, so those are called the piping plovers, and those are protected under the Massachusetts Endangered Species Act. And the reason why we have to shut the beach down for them um, is because when they have chicks on the beach, um, vehicle traffic can pose a, a risk to the, the chicks. And I hope that anybody who's interested in visiting the area understands that it's a really special place, and I think that going on the tour really helps to understand why it's such a special place. And, you can see how beautiful it is by, by going on the tour. and um, You definitely learn a lot about the species that are protected here and um, other wildlife that lives out here. So, While we really enjoyed our time at the Great Point Lighthouse, it was time to head into town to try one of Nantucket's highly recommended restaurants. <laughs> to Corazon del Mar and it's a um, Latin influenced seafood place so I'm really excited. Hi, Everyone at Corazon was warm and welcoming. Chef and owner Seth Rayner explained our custom-made menu, highlighting their best dishes. There was even a course just for Isla. Her favorite, calamari. Corazon is, uh, the inspiration is a Latin love letter uh, from our travels to Mexico, Costa Rica, me surfing a lot, coming back to Nantucket, and wanting that food. on the half shell. These are drenched in a tomatillo salsa verde. Um, there's a little kick to it as they do have some chilies in there. Oh, wash that down with a little Florida caña. Oh, this is French. Oh, oh la la. <laughs> yeah, when you're on Nantucket and you're looking for the non-traditional Nantucket experience, uh, Corazon, you'll get it here. Colors are all based on Frida Kahlo's uh, palette. Colors change during the course of the day, so the walls become dark red, the orange becomes that burnt orange. Um, and what we did is, you know, the, the stars that are in the bar, those we brought back from Mexico, so we recycled the floor from the Pearl restaurant, and we put it on the ceiling so it has more of a barn-like appearance. So all these little uh, dimples and patina, those are actually I think they're women's high heel marks. So, uh, adds a little character. Yeah, exactly. The food was delicious, creative, and beautifully presented, down to the last course dessert passion fruit mousse and traditional Mexican churros y chocolate.
Our second day on the island, we decided to learn more about the history of whaling, so we headed off to the Whaling Museum, where we met Claire, our knowledgeable guide who shared the museum's original artifacts and told us about what life was like for a whaler on the island years ago. Thank you so much, Claire, for being our guide today. Oh, thank you for joining us. Whaling Museum. <laughs> and so can you just give us a little bit of background? We have this gorgeous view. And just can you give us a little bit of history about the Whaling Museum? Sure. The roof walk that we're standing on right now is the only public roof walk that is here in the downtown area of Nantucket. And it's meant, hopefully, to kind of serve as a way for people to uh, get a real sense of where they are out here, 30 miles to sea. Uh, one good thing for families to know about is our discovery room, which mm -hmm. is an excellent um, free-form creative space for children. Um, every day in July and August, we have a craft activity in the afternoon. We make crafts that are based on artifacts in our collection. But uh, year-round, families can visit the Discovery Room and play with stuffed whales and building blocks and learn a little bit more about whales and their biology as well as the life of a whaler and what it would have been like to go out to sea. The lifestyle of a whaler was pretty nasty. Um, you would be often out to sea for two or three years um, just in your little ship with you know, an, a crew of 15, 20 other men and it was pretty much a routine of boredom and then extreme constant labor. Once they caught a whale, they would go out into little boats, six men in a boat, um, trying to catch a whale, and um, they could be out to sea paddling miles away from their ship. Um, it sometimes took hours, even a day, to bring a whale back after it was killed, and once they got back to the ship, they would cut off all the blubber and get out all of the oil, and it was smelly, nasty, unpleasant work, greasy, dirty, and then it could sometimes be days or weeks or on a bad voyage, even months before they caught another whale. A lot of whalers did a lot of crafts to pass the time. They would take whale's teeth and practice the art of engraving scrimshaw on the whale's teeth, um, other things like that, which we have pieces of in our collection. And for the families back home, it was a very different life. Women would often go years without seeing their husbands, which was certainly lonely, um, but it also meant that women on Nantucket had a lot more autonomy than their sisters and uh, fellow women on the mainland. Many of them owned their own businesses here, uh, ran the households while their husbands were away. People still still whale here. Like, People do not still whale. Uh, it is illegal in the um, <laughs> how much I know in about the United the States. <laughs> After talking to Claire, we discovered the Cabinet of Curiosities. This room mirrors what an old museum would have had, an area with lots of different artifacts, which didn't necessarily relate to each other. The Whaling Museum has organized it to follow the alphabet one artifact per letter. Within the Cabinet of Curiosities, we found some of Mark's work, a reconstruction of the whale ship Essex. Mark is a professional ship model builder, and the Whaling Museum commissioned him to make a model of the famous whale ship Essex. The story of the Essex is quite dramatic, and was actually the inspiration for Herman Melville's Moby Dick. The ship was attacked by a whale in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, sinking the ship and leaving its crew to wander the sea for three months in a small whale boat, battling storms and starvation. One little detail, when the sperm whale rammed the ship, they were busy hammering nails, they were fixing a whale boat. And it's sort of been discovered that that kind of a sound is, a sound, is an aggressive sound to sperm whales. Because there was another shipwreck that happened in, you know, in the 20th century that was on a yacht that was rammed by a whale. And they were doing the same thing, they were pounding nails into something, and this dong, dong, dong sound is some, can be interpreted as um, you know, an aggressive sound, and so, so the sperm whale was enraged and rammed the ship. 
And how many survived in the end? Was it five? Five. 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 Survived. And, and then the rest of them starved to death. Or starved to death, or actually one of the one of the terrible stories is when they decided, you know, somebody has to die so the rest of us can live, and so they drew straws, and it was the captain's nephew that drew the short straw, and he and the captain offered to take his place, and the and the nephew said, well, my lot is as good as any other, and he put his head down, and they oh, they had a gun. They had a, they shot him with a pistol, and they they ate him. Well, thanks for that enlightening well, story. You know, that's... Let's go have some ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> we headed over to Nantucket Ice Cream, home of the famous Juice Guys and Nantucket Nectars. This is the worst part in the morning. The ice cream's super, super hard, so you gotta really dig. <laughs> it's a good workout too. Yo, ice cream arm. <laughs> uh, I just put in a little bee pollen. Peanut butter, whey protein. There's usually a line out the door. Thanks for the juice guys. Yeah, man, suck at ice cream. Come on back. Smoothies in hand, we took a break and looked out over the harbor in the heart of the town. Quack, quack. We then followed Mark, who wanted to show us some of the best, most hidden art studios on the island and meet some of the artists working there. So this was an old scallop shanty. It was originally owned by the Andrews family, the last of the old Nantucket watermen. And he kept all his fishing gear here. And for many years, it sat pretty decrepit, you know, junk all over the place. So after George died, fixed it up and put new pilings under it, reshingled it, and got it into the shape it's in now. And it's still used during scallops season. But my friend Robert McKee has a painting studio here, and right now he has a painting class going. And so you'll see some of the artists that are painting, and you'll meet Robert and stuff. And so come on in. You gotta come here because this place is so for real. Well, this is, like, this yeah. is what it used to be like here. This is, this is Robert McKee. He's a, a longtime Nantucket resident, scholar, uh, jack of all trades, and now a painter for, for quite some years. Not now a painter, still a painter. Still a painter. <laughs> I'll let you tell that part of the story. <laughs> Finally, late in his life, he's been blessed with probably the best studio that Nantucket Island has to offer. That's true. Which is this particular place. When I first came here, this place was empty and the only thing going on was a couple of restaurants in the summer and in the winter everybody went fishing or you know, collected unemployment, I guess. The people who come here as a tourist today can only hear about what I consider to be the authentic Nantucket because it doesn't exist anymore. The Nantucket that I think is my Nantucket, now the new people have their Nantucket, and it's their Nantucket, and the people before me probably didn't like it when I got here, you know, with all the other hippies. <laughs> they, they, they didn't like hippies when I first came here. You know, things are like that. Mm. Things change. <laughs>